Welcome back. The Pentagon has more than 600 AI projects underway, but that doesn't signal a race necessarily for artificial intelligence as a part of great power competition. Paul Shari is vice president and director of studies at the Center for a New American Security. He's writing about debunking the AI arms race theory in War on the Rocks. Paul, I always appreciate how you make this stuff easy enough for even me to understand it. You lead this piece by writing, there is no AI arms race. Where did people like me who think that go wrong, Paul? Um, yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, it is, I wanted to put it out there because I do think that that's a, a popular conception. Um, we see militaries in the United States, in China, in Russia, investing in AI, and oftentimes people leap to this frame of, it's an arms race. Uh, it's a bit pedantic, um, maybe a bit academic, but when we think about arms race, uh, generally scholars define that as a place where there is runaway defense spending between uh, countries that's beyond normal levels. So examples being the Anglo-German arms race in the early 20th century, the Cold War nuclear arms race. We don't see that with AI today. In fact, when you look at AI as an actual amount of spending, it's pretty small. It's a tiny fraction of the Defense Department's budget. So uh, senior leaders talk about AI a lot. It's, I hate to say it because I think it's important. It's a lot of hot air um, and we don't really see the investments following through so is it an important area? Do we need to do more? Absolutely. Um, but we shouldn't get caught up in some of the, the hype and rhetoric about what's going on. What I like also about this piece, Paul, is that there's tremendous context here. You write AI in and of itself. AI is not a weapon. It's more like electricity, the internal combustion engine, or computer networks. What does that mean for the way that people in the Defense Department in particular, but the federal government more broadly, uh, for, what does that mean for how they should think about it? And what does it also mean for the way that Congress should think about it from an appropriations and authorization perspective, Paul? Right, so the frame of a general purpose technology means it's really an enabler for a wide variety of things. Um, I think computers are, are a great example here, as are electricity, for example. So how do we find ways to import that and adopt it really quickly? And I think what matters most here is AI is in some ways like the opposite of stealth technology. It's not being made in a secret defense lab. It's not technology that we can control and limit others access to. It's already the playing field globally is, is really level, much more level than we would like. Um, so we would like a world where we have a lead on the basic technology. And that's not very realistic today. In fact, when you look at top tier AI companies, yes, there are a number of US companies in the mix uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, all top AI companies, but also in that mix are Chinese firms, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, SenseTime, iFlyTech, all global AI leaders. And so our adversaries, our competitors, they're gonna have access to the technology too. If we're going to stay ahead in this military competition, it's gonna be an implementation. It's gonna be in finding ways to take this technology and use it. I'll make a comparison here uh, to the industrial revolution. A lot of people have compared AI to another industrial revolution. When we look at technologies that came out of the industrial revolution, having a slight edge uh, in the actual basic technology isn't what mattered. You look at what the Germans were able to do with the, the Blitzkrieg, they didn't have you know, unique capability with the internal combustion engine. Everyone else had access to the same technology. They found ways to put it together to battlefield effects that were uh, more significant and transformative. And that's when we need to focus our attention on AI. How do we create an iterative process, prototyping, experimentation, concept development, to make sure that we're using the technology better than competitors? All right, so to that end, you write in this piece, the most important step defense leaders could take in the near term would be to implement the necessary intro, uh, internal processes to ensure adequate test evaluation, validation, and verification of AI systems. It sounds like what you're suggesting there is get the fundamentals right, lay the foundation right, and then build those capabilities that you just described on top of that. Am I interpreting it correctly, Paul? That's exactly right. And, and you know, one of the real challenges with AI um, and machine learning in particular, we see this huge explosion over the last decade in deep learning, a particular type of machine learning, which is a, a, a particular method for creating intelligent systems, is it can be very powerful. 
could do some really amazing things. Um, we've seen AI systems using machine learning achieve superhuman performance in games like Go. Um, we've also seen machine learning beat human performance at benchmark uh, tests in things like image recognition. So there's a lot of value here. The DoD is employing it for things like predictive maintenance, processing images, um, doing natural language processing of, of DoD documents. That's incredibly valuable. The technology is also very brittle. So one of the problems with AI is when you are training this machine learning system, it's very good for circumstances that you've trained it against. But if the, if the environment that you're using it in is just ever so slightly different than the training data, its performance can fall off very dramatically. Um, and in fact, DOD leaders have talked about this in the context of, for example, Project Maven, where once they originally built this image classification algorithm and they took it out into the real world, out into the, into the Middle East, into an operational environment, its performance dropped off and it needed some tweaks, needed some modifications, some updating based on the environment. So we need to make sure that when we put these tools in the hands of warfighters, we're putting in tools that are trustworthy, that are actually gonna work the way that they uh, are intended to work and that people are gonna get, warfighters are gonna get the same reliability out of these AI systems that they've come to expect out of other types of technologies that we're putting into their hands. Paul Shari, thanks very much. It's great to have you back on the show. Thank you, thanks for having me.